This is Designing the Revolution. You're listening to Chapter 23, Part 2, The Sociology of Revolution. All right, so in Part 1, we were looking at the sociology, the historical sociology of revolutionary episodes, uprising episodes. And we're sort of trying to draw out a number of themes of how <clears throat> how this how this goes right you know the patterns of history as you might say so we've already in part one discussed um how the coalitions that build are are not necessarily clear they're not necessarily left right in some simplistic way they tend to be more like an unsteady coalition, alliance between groups that want to stop, you know, the run of capitalist development and other people that want to speed it up, at least classically in the 19th century, uh, when there was a big revolutionary uh, bunch of episodes against the aristocracy, autocracy and somewhat. And then we went on to say that this is sort of replicated in the modern era because you've got um, this notion of construction of the people, that it's no longer a Fordist situation where um, Ford, by the way, is, you know, the mass production of cars, Ford cars, you know. Uh, mass trade unions, mass society, mass political parties. We haven't got that anymore. We've got this disparate post postmodernist uh neoliberal sort of society where there's loads of groups and they're not sure who's in alliance with it, who and we've got this greater agency to put together these different groups into some revolutionary formation which has a sort of echo of what they were doing in the 19th century when you had conservative groups and radical groups coming together against the aristocracy as you might say okay so and what then we went on to discuss was what the historical sociology seemed to imply is that there is a point where revolutions become inevitable and paradoxically at the same time there is a enormous amount of agency that you have particularly during a revolutionary process to actually create a pro-social outcome because you've got all these people looking for meaning and trying to work out what they think and what they don't think because everything's in disruption. You haven't got a nice, solid, regular society that's going on for decade after decade. Things are all flying around. Which sounds familiar because obviously that's sort of where we're at at the moment or where we're going into because of the reasons we've discussed in previous episodes with the climate catastrophe and related uh, related matters all right so in this in this second section I'm sort of half thinking I might do a third but we'll see how we get on I'm going to look at um, the soci historical sociology of violence uh, how that's worked his uh, over the last hundred years we've discussed that somewhat before but I'm going to go through it again and um, and then I'm going to look at the dynamics of of how to um, win the peace, as it were. In other words, the revolutionary period itself, how you come out with something that's pro-social and progressive rather than a re reversion to, to um, you know, the same old authoritarian context, uh, which is obviously a big theme. Then I'm going to look at more details on how radical you need to be where where do you become extreme where do you become counterproductive okay and then we'll have some concluding comments and look at how we're going to look at this the revolutionary episode from various angles in 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 the future talks okay so you know in other words we're getting to the heart of, heart of the subject having spent quite a few episodes you know building up <laughs> so let's deal with this you know violence issue now we've we've already you know, I've already done an episode um, on sociability in action. So in some ways, I'm going to revisit this. But as I said, drawing more explicitly on, on the formal sociological uh, literature and research. So as we've already established, there's broadly these two tar uh, paradigms. And I'm trying to get you out of the, out of the headspace of thinking, 
this is all a simple left-right thing. You know, you've got the left, you've got the right, they're bashing against each other and you can't have any sort of murkiness about that. You know, it's a solid thing. As I've tried to say in the previous talk, this is very much a historical construct in the sense that there wasn't a left and right before uh, the French Revolution, for instance. There was lots of different alliances between different groups. So what I'm trying to say in the 21st century <clears throat> is the left-right thing is certainly important, right? It's not, we're not throwing, throwing the baby out the bathwater, as I'm always saying, okay? But what I want us to try and focus on is in the 21st century, in re re designing the revolution involves a new paradigmic um, conflict, right? Which isn't strictly left or right, though it is sort of related. And in some ways that that paradigm is, you know, we've discussed different ways of putting it, but for the sake of argument, for the purposes of political violence, we're saying, look, there's one paradigm which is othering people, <clears throat> reducing people to a function of a group, reducing people into a materialistic enemy, um, uh, and therefore justifying physical violence, justifying verbal violence, justifying oppression against that group. And um, and obviously, traditionally and conventionally, as you might say, this is this is um, you know right wing forces pushing against the people, i.e., the left. And we all know from the history of the last hundred years, there's a uh, 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 a history also of the left pushing against the right and basically using the same reductive, uh, violent methodologies, and consequently you result in civil wars, um, massive amounts of social conflict, and the basic horrendous shit shows, which, as we'll come on to discuss, don't actually improve society. You just end up broadly where you were before. So one of the, you know, one of the big criticisms of this is this podcast is people have come to me and say, well, revolu you know, revolution is X. Revolution is, is a revolution. You know, you go through all this turmoil, violence, and then at the end of the day, you just end up with all, saying old shit again. And yes, there's a lot of historical evidence for that, particularly for violent revolutions. However, what we're trying to redesign here is a non-violent revolution, right? A revolution of sociability, as we've discussed uh, a lot uh, in previous episodes. And this is a 21st century revolution. In other words, it's a specific revolution because we're designing it. We're designing it to actually make it work, okay? Otherwise, what's the point? What's the point? There isn't any point because you're just going to end up with the same old crap. And what we know from the literature is it is possible, historically, from historical sociology, to have revolutions which do significantly uh, push society forward in a more pro-social way. So how does that work and how, how, are we going to, uh, how are we going to design that? That's what we're broadly talking about. Okay, so so just to ex expand on this, we've got this this frame of instrumentalization, the use of violence, violence as a tool, secrecy as a tactic, uh, property damage as a tactic. You know, this there's this mix of different things, and lots of people have been talking to me about you know how to buy develop a pipeline which is this book, which is out, and I'll probably do a bigger video on it at some point. But I'm going to reference it a little bit in, in, in the next 20 minutes as I run through all of this and show how the How to Blow Up a Pipeline uh, book is, is embedded in this instrumental materialist frame, this discussion of if we do this, then we'll push against this force and we'll win. And obviously the harder we push against it, the more it will fall over. In other words, it's this mechanical Newtonian universe, which has nothing to do with the modern psychology and the modern um, sociology of actually how societies change. It's all about meaning systems, as, as we discussed, because dare I, say it, dare, I say, dare I say it, we're humans, we're not lumps of brick or whatever, right? Okay, so how does this work out in, in more detail? I'd sort of like to just draw a parallel here be between our, our proposition of sociability 
and the history of the feminization of the left. By feminization of the left, what I'm referring to is there was a time, particularly in the late 19th century, early 20th century, where women were denigrated in radical revolutionary circles, you know, in all the sort of standard bollocks ways that we're probably familiar with, you know, women aren't strong, women aren't intelligent, women can't protect leadership positions, women need to be in support roles, it's the men that run things, they're more clever, all these things which I'd have claimed explicitly or implicitly um, or, 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 on, on, in left-wing groups. And then what you see is this growing paradigmic shift of saying, no, you know, number one, women are absolutely equal to men on a philosophical sort of moral level. But then the sociology of men and women, the research on men and women grew and there's no difference in intelligence. There's no difference in their ability to lead. There's no difference in their ability to participate in 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 social and revolutionary struggle. And then over, you know, half century, you, and particularly in the 1960s, you get this more radical critique. Do you don't want hierarchy, you don't want machismo, you don't want sexual like harassment and all this crap. And now this is totally accepted. No one in their right mind wants to go back to the pre-1960s. Why that? Because you've got this completely new paradigm that even if, even if, the revolutionary cause was going to be more successful by putting women on the back row, as it were. No one's going to accept that because philosophically and ethically, it's just an impossible proposition. This is what we need to do with sociability, that the very idea of engaging in violence is just as abhorrent as treating women as shit. Treating other people as shit, whether they're police people or the ruling class or whatever, is simply unacceptable. It's philosophically like redundant. It's it's culturally decrepit. <laughs> you know, it creates it creates all sorts of problems. We'll talk about in a minute. Um, and it doesn't work. It just doesn't work, right? In the same way as putting women on the back row doesn't work because you just lose resources. You know, just in that instru instrumentalist way. Okay, so. Let's look at what the historical sociology is saying. What explanations is it giving for why engaging in political violence um, is, is um, a completely empirically contradictory uh, uh, strategy? Um, the key reason is because as soon as you engage in the othering of other people, in other words, they're not fully human, we can be justified in engaging in violence towards them, whether that's verbal violence or physical violence. Then what happens is you get what's called overpolarization. In other words, the other group goes, well, you're going to be that shitty towards us. We don't even want to talk to you. OK, or if you're going to engage in violence towards us, we don't even want to talk to you, which is diametrically different to the sociability civil resistance model where, as you remember, there's two elements. There's the disruption, but the function of the disruption is to create the dialogue. It's a one-two move, right? What the violence paradigm is, is it's a one-one-one-one-one. There's only one game in town. Push, 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 push. Destroy the enemy. Overwhelm the police. Overwhelm the army. Get control of the state. Kill people, right, that don't agree with you. Uh, this is a continuation of this, of this logic. Um, so there's no re-coming together on society, which is basically why civil wars create, you know, half century traumas. Look at Spain, look at the US, uh, look at Russia. Um, this is not just bad. It's just catastrophic in terms of creating the complex pro-social society that 95% of people want to live in. More specifically, what the literature shows over and over again is as soon as you get this move towards othering, you get a move towards verbal violence, then you get a move towards instrumentalization of violence. You know, we're doing this in order to get this. And what that creates is this overbunding of the revolutionary space. In other words, it becomes secretive. 
it becomes hierarchical. No one quite knows what to do. People have to take orders because you can't have an open democratic discussion. Um, and this creates machismo, macho behaviour, creates sexist behaviour, it creates um, backfire, it, it creates corruption, right? It cre you, you, you open yourself up to being infiltrated by the state and then you know, that's really, once that happens, which is more or less inevitable, then the state finds out what you're doing anyway. So this happens over and over again. You know, you get this, this logic of increased secrecy, paranoia, machismo behaviour, and then it's all useless anyway, even within its own terms of reference, because it just gets infiltrated by state agents. And, you know, the state loves it because it's trying to replicate, you know, it's on, on the home territory of what the state wants, which is which is the opponent to be violent because they know how to deal with that sort of thing. OK, so what this fundamentally um, stops then is the central tactic, the central move of civil resistance, which is backfiring, which we've talked about a lot. In other words, the reason why backfiring works, i.e. you go into battle they bash you, they do you in, and then the public comes on your side is because they can see you. Most concretely, they can see your eyes, they can see your body, they can see your human, they're seeing that you can speak. You're on the, the media, you're saying, I'm doing this, do your worst, I'm fearless, I'm, I'm in public, I'm prepared to go to prison, all this sort of thing. The public's going, oh my God, in in even despite themselves, they're going to start to respect, respect you because that's fun, the fundamental dynamic of human psychology is if you see that fearlessness, that moral stance, you're immediately drawn to that person. If there's, if there's just a statement from a closed group, you can't see the person. You can't empathise with them. What you see is a degraded form of communication, right? And that means there's no backfiring. No one's going to sympathise with you. You know, some people will sympathise with you, obviously, right? But they sympathise often out of fear. You know, they must support you because they're terrified of what's going to happen. Or you only get really degraded systems. You get a mafia-esque dynamics where you've got to support them. You know, you've got to support the IRA because of this, that and the other, for instance. Um, you know, for, for, because you get this mafia degeneration in the space. OK, so... It doesn't work, right? What, as we'll come on to discuss in a minute, all, all it works is this, you get this consolidation of two hard blocks in society, but you're not actually going to succeed, or at least not very often. And even if you do succeed, you're not going to win the piece, as we'll come on to in a minute. So the third, the third element here is ease of entry. So it's important to understand that how civil resistance works in the historical sociology is you get this big upsurgence of popular popular participation you don't have to go and buy a gun you don't have to enter this secret society you don't have to get recruited you don't have to go to secret meetings at three o'clock in the morning there's the square you go to the square and it's the the demos expressing itself and saying fuck you basically to the establishment as as a physical crowd okay that's an entirely different paradigm to the sort of militaristic degeneration that you get through through the sort of violent paradigm. Okay, and the important thing, of course, is, is this, is it's an easy message and it's ease of entry. Easy message, go to the square. Ease of entry, you can get into the square, right? It's easy, you don't need to do loads of stuff. Um, and what that means is it's profoundly and structurally democratic. It's not hierarchical or uh, macho. In other words, very young people can go, very old people can go, minorities can go, everyone can go, right? As opposed to a secretive paradigm where by definition it self-selects mainly young men and uh, uh, and uh, and such like. Okay, so the last, the last, the fourth point here is is a more subtle but probably the most important point really, which is What's happened to societies over the last two or three hundred years? You've had really simple societies in the sense that the social structure is really quite uh, straightforward. You know, you have 
95% of the population are peasants, you have a little middle class and you have the aristocracy. And as soon as they've got a bit of a surface, they go to war and there's this zero sum social Darwinist situation where they're always battling against each other. And then there's occasionally revolt and, and such like. But the fundamental point here is that is that there's no dense network connections in the social space. People live really simple lives. There's only a certain number of things they do. There's only a certain number of people they see. There's only a certain number of interest groups. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you've got this mass complex society we have at the moment. And what this complex society is based upon is massive amounts of interconnectedness and massive amounts of relationships which aren't based on violence, but are based upon negotiation, based upon sociability connections and what have you. And this arguably is what social progress looks like. Now, what violence does is, yes, you can win with a violent strategy, but what it tends to do is revert society back to a simple model, a simple oppression model that you base, you know, a bit like in the Soviet Union, you've got an elite and then you've got a mass of workers and and the whole system works upon fear and terror. In other words, like I have to do this, otherwise bad things are going to happen to me rather than this free association and social relations that we have. So, yes, you know, what we need to try and decide is in the 21st century, are we trying to bring this complex society in some sort of profound reform uh, so we can maintain this complexity? Or do we want to revert to this super simplistic uh, societies based upon violence? Well, obviously, whether you, depend, you know, some people will want to revert to that simple routine. But I can tell you, you know, there's no question that 95% of the population wants to maintain this complexity for all the advantages it provides for us. OK. All right. So, you know, I think I might have gone through these stats before, but I'm just going to repeat them. There's a bunch of, of you know, there's a bunch of sources on on revolutions and how they don't get very far because they engage in violence. But the systematic research on this is why civil, uh, why civil resistance works. Eric uh, Chenyos research and such like. And the headline figures are 25 percent of violent revolutions, uprising works. 56% of non-violent uprisings or revolutions uh, work. In, in other words, they have a clear definition of, of success. Now, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't, uh, that's probabilistic, okay? So we know when people engage in civil resistance, there's no guarantees. You've got a one in two chance, let's say. And if you engage in a violent situation, you may well win. But this is the really important thing, is to win to win just means to take power. That taking power is a means to an end, obviously, assuming you're an ethical revolutionary. The taking of power doesn't actually mean anything. It just means you're in control. What actually a revolution means is that you bring greater sociability and justice into that society. And the devastating statistic is of all the violent uprisings, stroke revolutions, those that are successful, inverted commas, 19 out of 20 of them have reverted into some sort of civil war or authoritarian dictatorial regime within five years of them coming to power. So this is based on over 300, I think, data points. So this is not about cherry picking. It's about modern social research. And it verifies what people have known for at least 50 years now, which is the whole 19th century revolutionary paradigm is out of date, it's dysfunctional, and at worst, it's just a criminal bollocksy thing to do. Yeah, it just makes no sense. It has no place in the paradigm of civil resistance, radical social change, revolution in the 21st century. It has no more place in, in, that, par in that project as, as uh, misogynistic sexism does. And as I've tried to allude to, the two, the two propositions move in parallel, right? Is if you're going to have a social, a sociability feminized space, then that's fundamentally incompatible with uh, a space that engages in the other ring of the opponent. Um, okay, so um, that's the violent situation, as you might say. 
So the next strategic learning from the literature, from the historical sociology, is something which might be summed up as the victory is only the first act. We've already identified that one of the biggest problems thinking strategically about all of this is is that you don't actually prepare for uprising episodes coming out of nowhere so that when they do come out of nowhere you're not prepared and you can't consolidate and make these uprisings sustainable and a lot of what we've talked about in these episodes is is preparing for a come out of nowhere episode in order Uh, according to You're designing the revolution uh, perspective here. What the literature points out is successful revolutions do two things. First of all, they keep the street movement. In other words, they don't tell everyone to go home. They go, hey, we've won now, everyone go back, back to jobs. What they say is just a matter of time until they're back because they're absolutely lying to us. They don't assume for a minute that the opposition, the elites uh, are, are, are telling the truth. In other words, the whole strategic political communication strategy is to say to the people, we've won and now we need to wait for them to come back. So we need to maintain our street movement. We need to still maintain all the civil disobedience infrastructure um, because it's just a matter of time before they're back and you're going to have to come back onto the streets. OK, secondly, it's so important according to literature, that once you're in power, 
you entrench that power institutionally so that you can't be dislodged by other elements of the state that are going to um, going to subvert you. So you might think now you control the state. Well, of course you don't. You just control, you know, the central decision making structure. There's a the civil service. Um, there's uh, the police force. There's the business community. There's the church. All these groups may or may not uh, particularly wish you well and probably won't. So they're going to use their institutional power to sabotage what you want to do. So you need to be thinking about, OK, what does it mean to turn this superficial political power into deeper institutional power so that you can't be un undermined? All right. So I'm going to, you know, go through one or two examples here, which are, you know, terrible stories <laughs> of how bad the bad people are uh, without over othering them, dare I say. But so a great book to read is like Adults in, in, in the Room. Uh, oh, my God, I can't remember his name. Do you know his name? Yanis Yakovakis, I think he's called. I'm sure you'll correct me. Uh, anyway, he's a great guy. I had a few chats with him and he wrote this Adults in the Room, which, as you may know, uh, is a book about Syriza coming to power in Greece um, around 2014, I think, uh, due to the um, Greek economy collapsing under a mountain of debt. I'm not going to go into the, the sort of gruesome details of it, but the, the general dynamic here was they took control of the state but of course, they didn't control the state because the European Union and the financiers control the state. So then they made the naive idea uh, of going to negotiate with these people. And they found, you know, this book is just a catalogue of systemic lying over and over again. Yes, we're going to be nice to you. And then they're not. Yes, we'll make an agreement with you. But then we're not. You know, yes, we'll be decent and not message against you in the media and at the same time they're doing all of this in other words there's a systematic uh, attempt uh, which was successful in this case to undermine the notion that there's national sovereignty that the greek people don't want to keep paying the debt you know for all the reasons you probably know so despite the fact that Syriza went from four percent to forty percent uh, they had this liberal naive strategy of negotiation with these bad guys who had no intention of playing ball. The alternative strategy, as we've just mentioned, would have been to embed their power in the popular sovereignty of the people. We're going to be talking about this lots, lots more because this is the major move. But just to give you a taste of it, what they did is they made a classic left-wing 20th century error of separating themselves from the people. They said, thank you very much. We've won the election. We control the, the Greek state. We're going off to the EU and we're saying we represent the people. But that word represent the people doesn't mean anything because all the people have gone back, you know, to their day jobs and they're just assuming the government gets on with it. What they have to do is proactively engage the people through citizens' assemblies, through local assemblies, so that the people decide that they will resist the EU uh, attempting to impose more debt on them. In other words, they own that proposition. In other words, the people have become the state, right? That's in, in a visceral, material power sense. So when the EU then goes, oh, you know, you've got to uh, accept this debt agreement, the people themselves are already committed, are already committed to popular resistance on that. So the government doesn't become isolated. Now, there's a whole bunch of variations on the feed. I'm not going to talk about it too much now, but you can see a sort of, you can see a, a fundamental strategic error here, which is rooted in historical sociology that goes back, right back to the, the French, French Revolution. So an, another example, you know, another classic example of the last 10 to 15 years, which is useful, of course, because you can sort of see how this is going to pan out in the mid and late 2020s, is is Iceland, again, during the 2008 crisis and how that panned out. I think it was in 2012, sorry if I forget the dates. But the general gist in Iceland was, you know, obviously this is a small country, so the state isn't particularly powerful. And to cut a long story short, there was a big, uh, you know, a non-violent uprising, classical civil resistance. Everyone cries around Parliament. The government resigns. They institute a citizen assembly to create a new constitution so they can embed 
you know, this new paradigm of post-capitalist, you know, pro-social, -so pro-nature sort of paradigm. All sounds good, doesn't it? And everyone goes home, notice the error, and then they present the uh, constitution to the parliament. The parliament's all bought out by corporate interests, and I think they lost by four votes. But the, but the problem was, was once they have lost, there was no street movement. So people weren't coming back to the parliament because the wave was over and they hadn't institutionalised their power. They hadn't kept that street movement going. So they made this like fundamental, often repeated error that they thought they had more power than they actually had. Um, another smaller example is there was a citizens' assembly in France. Everyone thinks, yeah, citizens' assembly is great. I think it was on, on the climate. Comes up with all these really dramatic things that the French state is supposed to be doing to respond to the climate crisis. You can all imagine the sort of thing. And if I've got my facts right, I think over the next since the citizens' assembly has uh, has has done the um, come up with it, these measures then Macron and the French regime has put into place, I think, 10% of what they've recommended. No surprises there, you know, from this realist sociology of revolution, historical sociology of political change. Of course, Macron's not going to accept these things because it's going to challenge capital, it's going to challenge uh, the, 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 the social hierarchy of society and such like, and he can get away with it. Why can he get away with it? Because there's no street movement synergized and integrated with the citizens assembly okay so what we're moving towards here is 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 the successful model as you might say of, of revolutionary episodes which is classically found in the french french revolution now i don't want to make some big moral judgments on the french revolution uh we know whether it was good or bad and the whole violence of it and all the rest of it come on to this a bit more in in a minute but what we can see in terms of a historical materialistic sort of analysis of the French Revolution is this constant classical interplay between a street movement, right, street resistance and institutionalisation. So again, to cut, simplify somewhat, what you had in this situation was, was uh, the fiscal crisis of the state, the calling of an assembly, the assembly refuses to budge to to pay out, to, to be taxed, to get the regime out of out of its crisis, then the then the regime tries to close down the assembly. This triggers a street movement that engages in mass resistance on the streets of Paris. That forces the regime to reinstitute a new assembly. The new assembly tries to institutionalize its power. It comes into conflict with the old regime. The old regime tries to get rid of it. The street movement comes back out, supports the assembly. And every time the, a new assembly is created, it's more radical and more revolutionary. So you can see this like pattern emerging because of this smart strategy of integrating uh, the assembly, the convention institutionalization space with the civil resistance street movement space. OK, and as a little aside at the end of just to finish off this section, is there's also a real clarity, I think, amongst the revolutionary leadership that they are on the side of virtue, as they would have said in the French Revolution. In other words, there's an ideology of virtue ethics, which is we have come to power to fundamentally reform society. We have not come to power to engage in expediency, compromise, the logic of, you know, negotiation. No, we're not compromising. We want this or nothing. And this is what creates this, this continual conflict between the old regime and the new regime. Because the new regime has an ideology which is a new paradigm about how to organise society. And again, we can argue whether that was a good way of arguing, you know, organising society or not. That's not the point here. In terms of the historical sociology, it's not making a moral judgment. What it's saying is, is the, the incoming revolutionary class has to have this really clear agenda about what it's got to do. And it uses this, ide this new ideology, using ideology as a neutral word here, um, to mobilise and um, use rhetoric and all the rest of it to create this this street movement. We're not 
we're not creating a street movement just to do you know a little campaign here this is not you know greenpeace friends of the earth right this is like the deal right this is the once in a generation attempt to fundamentally change all the crap that everyone's been laboring under for decades and i'm sure many of you watching this know how that feels so that when we actually do this we're clear about what we're what we're going to do and we're clear that we're going to combine this institutionalization strategy with the street movement strategy and we're going to watch out for every single lie that's going to be told to us because that's what the bad guys do all right that's that all right so we're going on to the third strategic learning of the historical sociology it's all dramatic stuff isn't it um so we've done the violence thing you know done the victory is the only first act thing i'm coming come on to this you're aiming at eight out of ten thing which is my way of dealing with a phenomenon that i don't know whether it has a name in the literature but it's certainly you know discussed in the history books in a lot and this is you know this is the classic critique of of, of revolution which is you know there's nice guys they're all heroic, they get to power, they radicalise, you know, they do great stuff and then they over-radicalise and start oppressing the people and then they become semi-fascist and then everything goes to shit and you end up with some nasty authoritarianism and you're back to where you were before. So you can see this pattern happening over and over and over again and, you know, the cynics will say, well, that's revolution for you. But that's historically illiterate because what we do know is the varying extents and sometimes to a large extent social progress is made and this is largely a function of revolutions being non-violent and revolutions having a pro-social you know broadly sociability or orientation so let's have a look at this in a little bit more detail then and see how this can be avoided and what the key historical factors are in this being minimized or the likelihood of it happening being minimized um, so the first thing to say is, you know, just to draw back to, come back to the violence uh, disaster, as you might say, is, is this, this process of what you might call over-radicalisation, reversion into a neo-reactionary leftist uh, cul-de-sac, is all part of this logic of violence, this logic of overpolarization and logic of othering, which is if you get into the habit of othering and being violent towards your opponent, once you get into power, you're not going to drop that culture because it is a culture, right? It's not a, oh, we've just decided on this tactic for a while. It goes, it gets into your soul. It goes into your way of looking at people. If we disagree with those people, if we're going to promote our program, then we're going to push those people out of power and you've got this bullying dynamic, this mafia dynamic that over the course of a year or two, you get less and less people doing more and more nasty people to more and more people. And we all know historically, you know, there's an example of Stalin, for instance. So it's essential at the, at the get go to understand this. This is the logic of violence, right? Sort of makes sense initially and then it degenerates. So how, how is this prevented? OK, so none of these things are, are, you know, mechanical do this and it'll work, but they all contribute to minimising the probability. And what we want, just to reiterate, is to get to eight out of ten. In other words, we don't want some liberal revolution that's just going to tinker around, you know, at five and six. We want a full on democratic pro-social revolution, which is about eight out of ten. But we don't want to go to 9 out of 10 and 10 out of 10. We don't want to be descending back into authoritarianism, which is 9 out of 10, 10 out of 10. Hence this, you know, thing to put in your fridge, which is 8 out of 10. All right. So one of the classical explanations for why positive revolutions work is strategic and moral leadership. OK, so a lot of people have a problem with this in this, you know, post-1989 horizontalist sort of, you know, rubbish <laughs> that I've been trying to describe. Strategic and moral and charismatic leadership is absolutely essential. Absolutely essential. Let me be super clear on this. 
to the success. People look to leaders, people have always looked to leaders and they always will. That emphatically does not mean that you can't have democratic leadership, you can't have ethical leadership, you can't have rotating leadership, but there needs to be leadership in order to bring people into a new way of looking at, uh, at how, how, they're, how they're going to operate as a society. And critical to this, of course, is saying to them, we're staying at eight out of 10. So if you think about a herd of people, they're charging towards the state, you know, they're charging into radicalism. There's a massive momentum to keep going. Let's find the other group. Let's radicalize even more. Let's other another group. Uh, so if you think of a cavalry officer at the front of this, this, you know, big mass of people, they've got to have a lot of authority to go, no, we're stopping now. We're stopping now because if we go any further, we're going to undermine our fundamental moral purpose. No, we're not going to shoot those people. OK, they're not the problem. The problem is to consolidate the radical pro-social place we've got to. So if you're familiar with your history, you know, a classic example of this is Gandhi. Uh, in, in India going, we're calling off the campaign because it's turning violent. There's no point in turning violent because we're just going to, you know, pile on loads of crap and millions of people stand and start killing each other. So he used his personal authority to say, no, we're stopping. We're cashing in our, our chips, as it were. We've made progress and now we're going to stop. The reason he could do that, of course, because he was a charismatic, a highly ethical leader. Uh, another example, of, you know, just as famous example is Mandela. You know, he's in prison for what, 25 years. He comes out and says, no, we're not going to other the whites. We're not going to engage in some bloodbath of revenge and, you know, uh, and, and such like. We're going to have a reconciliation process and people are going to come together and we're going to say, no, we're, we're going for forgiveness. We're going for uh, move on, right? We need to move on. The past is the past and such like. And there's a whole bunch of dynamics about how reconciliation processes can happen, which we may discuss in, fu in future episodes. But you can see how that works. And last but not least, there's Havao in 1989 with Czechoslovakia. You know, this guy who's enormous moral authority. Uh, he, he leads a revolution. It remains, you know, effectively 100% non-violent. And there's this effective transition to the post-communist period. OK, secondly, the non-violence culture. So the non-violence culture, notice, it's not non-violence, it's not a tactic, it's a culture, it's a way of being, it's a way of relating to people. So the more that this is embedded, uh, as juxtaposed to this logic of violence, then the more likely people are going to move towards an assembly model of social change rather than a physical coercion, violent, you know, we're taking control of the police sort of thing. No, the power resides in the authority and the will of the people manifested through the assembly. In other words, there's this turn towards uh, genuine democratization rather than this move towards sort of leftist, authoritarian, top down, we're in charge, we'll tell you, you know, what's right and wrong sort of stuff. And you can see this a little bit in the historical example. Again, you, you should read more. You know, this is an invitation to read the literature. But you can see this arguably in the American Revolution, uh, the American War of Independence. Yes, it was violent and what have you. But underlying this was some ethical uh, commitment to moderation, to uh, eth ethical refusal to other other people, the the British, and and uh, a pre-existing culture of popular participatory democracy town hall meetings and such like so you know there's loads of complications around this but you can broadly see the argument that in the, in the american revolution you also you had this um willingness and ability to start at, stop at eight out of ten not go for killing the british and you know having an authoritarian state and it was helped of course by george washington being you know, arguably a semi-decent guy and not wanting to become king of America, um, which at the time was massively, uh, massively radical um, uh, historical episode because no one had actually done this before, right? Usually you had revolutions, uprisings, and you had this complete reversion to a new form of authoritarianism. Okay, so the third thing here is, is um, and hopefully we'll discuss this more, but this is like a fundamental philosophical understanding 
that there's no logical end to the notion of justice. So there's this big debate uh, between Foucault and um, Maoists in power stroke knowledge in one of Foucault's books. So the Maoists are saying, look, we're going to have courts, we're going to have some sort of due process, and we're going to try, you know, the bourgeoisie. And then what Foucault says is, no, you know, that's not real justice, that's bourgeois justice. You know, courts are intrinsically bourgeois. What you need to do is get rid of the courts and have people's justice, which is, you know, concretely an invitation for mob rule. Uh, I think that's fair to say. So obviously what Foucault was doing was he's perfectly correct. The logic is, is courts are partial justice by definition because they exist in the real world and they have a whole bunch of objective criteria which arguably aren't objective and all the rest of it. So he was sort of right, but he was wrong because he's, if you go from, you know, courts, i.e. 8 out of 10, to mob justice, you're not actually getting better justice at all. You're actually getting worse justice. It just looks like it's, it's better justice. In other words, there has to be an arbitrary point. And so note the word arbitrary. R revolutionary ra rationalism will, will basically take you to hell, like anything that you take to an extreme. And this is one of the big problems with Western political thought, radical thought, is people don't know when to stop. And it's a very valid conservative critique, of course. Um, and uh, what I'd like to do is juxtapose that sort of orientation to this other philosopher, modern philosopher called Roti, uh, Richard Roti, who has this hilarious idea, I think it's hilarious, of you just bodge it, right? Most issues, uh, when they come down to the finer points, n there's, no clear, there's no clear reason why something's right or wrong. So although he's a bit of a postmodernist, a bit like Foucault, he's clever enough, unlike Foucault, dare I say it, to actually work out that you just have to have an intuition. In other words, you have to have a, a participatory sense rather than an imposed rationalistic scientific logic. And you could say, this is where we're going to stop, right? We're going to stop here because it feels like a good place to stop. And that is actually a very radical move because it under, undermines this extreme rationality. And this extreme rationality is very much connected with the capitalistic, you know, extractive, machismo, patriarchal proposition that rationality is everything and an instrumentalization is everything. And that's why we can just go and kill nature and kill other people because we're just focusing on this task of justice, as it were. So please be clear. Justice is an enormously important concept, but it's not God, right? It's not, um, it's not there to be taken to the 100%, because if you try and take it to the 100%, in other words, if you play, try and play God, basically you'll create hell. You won't create heaven. And this is the story of many revolutions, of course. Okay, the last thing I want to mention, I'm going to talk about this more, so I'm going to just say a few enticing things about it, is the process of taking power and pushing for nine and 10 out of 10 is, is focused on, on, on a logic of power um, and the corruption of power. So what we're gonna be talking about a lot, as I think I've said a few minutes ago, is this notion of assemblies, notions of sortition, notions of, of basically designing out this meta head fuck sort of problem of how do you organize the state without it degenerating into a sort of a power mad top-down nasty situation that you know everyone who's watching this podcast wants to avoid well maybe we can all right so i'm not pretending for a minute by the way that the historical sociology hasn't got to say loads more things but we've sort of hopefully got a <coughs> we've got a bit of an agenda here about what we want to do what we don't want to do and how we're going to do this and and as we're going into this fray you know into the melee of re revolution it's just worth maybe in conclusion thinking about the broad top level situation here so the top level situation is the revolution is inevitable these revolutions are coming down the line if you don't like revolutions tough shit 
they're coming anyway, right? Because we've got to the point of no return on the climate crisis and related, you know, secondary effects, as we discussed. Secondly, there's a smart strategy here from the historical sociology, from the social science. There's things to avoid. The stupid things people, mistakes people make over and over again. We cannot afford to make these mistakes again. Like this is the end of the world. If we mess up, the amount of suffering and injustice is going to be indescribable. So there's a big incentive to get this right. Study the literature. Don't make those mistakes. And thirdly, what is the emergent program here? What's the emergent new society? How are we going to concretize this? You're probably saying, well, Roger, you know, what's the plan? What's the plan? What's the plan? And I'm going, right, we're coming on to it. But what we're starting to think about is a fundamental redefinition of democracy, which is based upon deliberative, deliberative assemblies, which is based upon sortition, choosing people by chance. And I'll be going into this in great depth. So there is a plan here. We're not just going to replicate the French Revolution, thank God, right? Lastly, secondly, the second big thing to bear in mind is how we look going to look at this process is we're not going to be going, do this, do this, do this, do this. We're going to be looking at the whole and then we're going to put it down and come back and look at the whole again. And we're going to see how the thing at the end influences the thing at the beginning. In other words, it's messy, OK? I'm not going to make any excuses about it. So it's not going to be clear quite a few episodes how it's all going to fit in to fit together i'm just probing the system and pulling things out and saying oh yeah here's a good idea you know how does this fit together so you'll have this emergence of a sense of how this revolution is going to work and the key elements are going to be about coalition building about deliberative democracy about the political program these are the major sort of headings of the next few few episodes and the last thing that I'm going to say is what you're going to put in your fridge this week, OK, as well as eight out of ten, you're going to have to have two pieces of paper. But this on your fridge, which is how do we win the peace? OK, how do we win the peace? This is not about enacting a revolution. It's about enacting a revolutionary period, which is going to fundamentally transform society for the better, which means winning people over, winning over your opponents winning the peace, right? It's easy to win the war. How do you win the peace? You know, it's a great historical sort of um, conundrum. I think I'll leave it there. Thanks.